Welcome to the third episode of This is Epigenetics, the bilingual podcast presented by Cert Trainee Comedy, where we interview renowned Canadian scientists about their career, their research, and more importantly, their passion for epigenetics. In this week's episode, Sana Jensen and Edward Gardner interview Professor Jeff Dilworth from the University of Ottawa. We hope you will enjoy this insightful discussion about researching epigenetics. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. My name is Sana. And my name is Edward. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jeff Dilworth. Jeff did his PhD in the lab of Dr. Glenville Jones at Queen's University. He continued his scientific journey in France in the lab of Professor Pierre Chambron as a postdoc at Le Institut de Génétique et de Biologie Moléculaire et Cellulaire. Jeff then came back to North America as a research assistant in the lab of Dr. Stephen Tapscott at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. After his stint in Seattle, he then joined the Regenerative Medicine Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. He has remained there where he is now a senior scientist in the Sprost Center for Stem Cell Research. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, great to be here with you, Sana and Ed. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here with you too. So, to start off with, how are you today? I'm doing well. Uh, off to a good start in the day. That's good. It's always a good way to begin. So, we like to um, get started to get to know you a little bit better. Um, so would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I, I'm a Canadian born in Toronto uh, and did a good job with the introduction of um, my career path getting here. But uh, when I was younger, we lived in all different parts of Ontario. And so I, I got used to moving around and that uh, helped me out as a scientist. I, I have been to many places over my career. Uh, I was in Kingston uh, for uh, my PhD training, and uh, there I was working on vitamin D and how it gets metabolized, and we were really trying to understand um, how these new drugs that were being developed to mimic vitamin D could be more biologically active, and one of the reasons was that they were metabolized a lot less, uh, a lot more slowly. And, and we're staying around and this uh, led me to look at how these drugs were working and, and we were trying to understand mechanisms that they would turn on genes. And about that time, they were discovering transcription factors that were able to turn on gene expression uh, in response to things like vitamin D and vitamin A. And so having finished my PhD, I, uh, went across to France to work with uh, Pierre Chambon in order to try and understand how genes would be regulated. And it was a really exciting time to enter into transcription field because of the fact that um, co-activators were starting to be identified. And this, um, we, we didn't know how these co-activators were working, but we knew that these, the transcription factors needed co-activators. And so it was, um, an opportunity to go in and, and try to understand the mechanisms of how the uh, transcriptional activation would work. And that pulled me eventually into epigenetics. And uh, we, we came up with a model for how transcription would work, but that was a very simple model that couldn't explain how the same um, compound like vitamin A or vitamin D could turn on genes one set of genes in one cell and another set of genes in another cell. And so uh, before starting my own laboratory, I decided to go do a second postdoc and get some uh, experience in cell biology. And so I went out to uh, Seattle and uh, worked with Steve Tapscott and there moved into a muscle system. So getting away from the steroid hormones and, and trying to understand how genes would be turned on by muscle by the muscle transcription factors, MyOD. And uh, again, epigenetics came into that and, and formed the basis of me starting my own laboratory uh, in Ottawa back in 2004. Yeah, it's, it's been a great uh, trajectory going from uh, trying to understand how transcription was working uh, on a single gene to trying to understand how it works in the whole organism now. 
so you you've been to various places across the world and um, i'm wondering do you have a favorite country or city i i definitely have uh, lots of favorites uh places i, I the, the one thing about being a scientist is that you get to uh visit to give talks in places all over the world and, and i have so many great memories uh definitely the food in france was something that i really enjoyed and uh there's so many beautiful places to see there but also living on the west coast out in seattle was extraordinary also because the mountains are so beautiful seeing the sunset uh over the uh, olympic peninsula is something that you miss when you go away but lots of great memories but definitely seattle was a place that i really enjoyed yeah i hear it's very nice over there thinking about pre-pandemic times did you have a a morning routine before heading to the lab De- definitely i have a pre a pre-lab routine we have two uh, large dogs at home uh, that we uh Marjorie, my spouse, and I, we, we've always had dogs uh, since we were postdocs uh, in Seattle. So we, we end up spending a lot of time outside, but uh, uh, just prior to the pandemic, we, uh, we rescued uh, two dogs. One of them's a Malamute, who's 95 pounds, and the other one is a uh, Great Pyrenee uh, American Foxhound mix who also weighs 90 pounds. And uh, if we don't get out and take them for a long walk in the morning, then the house is probably not going to look very good when we get home in the <laughs> evening. There's a lot of energy for them to get out. Uh, so we, we, we live in a beautiful area of the city, which is uh, not far from the river, down, down near where the Governor General's estate is. and. So they can go in and go swimming and uh, there's an off-leash park for them to run around there and play with some other dogs and uh, then come home and have some breakfast and if there's any emails that are pressing get those out of the way before coming to the lab but otherwise have a quick shower get in the car and drive to work mm-hmm. and you, you definitely can't get away without the dog walk I can imagine what may happen to the house if you don't do that over here. <laughs> yeah, they're big enough to get into a lot of trouble over there. Definitely. So, moving into the scientific area of your life, when you began taking upper level courses, what steered you towards the sciences? So, I guess I became interested um, in science. Well, I, I've always been interested in science, and it was always my favorite subject in high school and and that led me to go into the biochemistry program at Queens. Uh, I I think initially I thought that I would want to go along the stream to become a medical doctor. And that uh, probably was influenced by my family uh, a little bit. Uh, Not that anyone in my family is a doctor, that they're they're all in the area of um, finance and business, but um, my dad was the uh, chairman of the board of the hospital in Hamilton, St. Joe's. And so I socially from my parents, I knew lots of doctors and sort of it seemed that that was the path that um, I I would take going through the sciences. Uh, And then once I got to third year university and we got more into the laboratories, uh, then my thinking started to change and it was, wow, making discoveries in the laboratories is a lot of fun. Uh, thinking about problems and, and trying to solve them uh, really, it got me excited in that direction uh, and really made me forget about wanting to become a medical doctor. And uh, eventually I went on into Glenville Jones's laboratory to start my research. And uh, I was very lucky because I was successful by chance right right from the beginning. Uh, And uh, I was able to get um, a few awards at international conferences, young, young investigator awards at international conferences in the 
uh, first couple of years versus my master's at, in, in the PhD. And um, from then just making discoveries and uh, the high that comes from knowing that you're the first person to discover something uh, is something that I don't think you can match in any other area. And, and it was just sort of the driving force of keeping me uh, interested in, in different scientific questions and, and uh, trying to resolve bigger problems uh, each time something bigger and bigger. And uh, yeah, that's it's so, sort of the path that led me in this direction. You mentioned that you, um, uh, that you had some luck uh, early on. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I, I think as a scientist, we're um, always uh, a little bit lucky and a little bit unlucky. And uh, experiments, uh, they, they will work or, or not work. You, you never know until you carry it out. And, and um, what, one of the best traits of a scientist is someone who's uh, persistent and is going to continue in the face of adversity because 90% of your experiments aren't going to work. And I, I think when I say that I got lucky, I, uh, I, I got my 10% of the experiments working off the bat. <laughs> and that made me realize that I can do this. Um, I, often if you get the adversity first, you start to question yourself, I believe. Uh, is what happens with a lot of trainees is uh, you go into a project and you um, try it a, a few different times and it doesn't work and, and you put into question your abilities to be able to do those experiments. And uh, if you start off and are able to have some success, you know that you can do something. And then when you hit the adversities, you can say, well, I just have to keep going at it and eventually it's going to come. And uh, if you're asking the right questions in the right way and um, doing the right controls, there, you have the ability to understand why the experiment's not working and eventually you're going to uh, find a way to make it work. And so, yeah, so that, that, that is what I meant by, I was lucky in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is such a thing as beginner's luck? Because I've heard multiple people talk about it where, you know, as a newbie coming in a lab, you do your first experiment and I don't know, I found it usually works, but then the second time it usually doesn't work. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I definitely think that there is beginner's luck and um, that, that's why it always frustrates me when I see somebody do an experiment without doing all the controls in it. And then they come back and show you the result and say, it, it look, look, it worked. And you ask them for the controls and they said, oh, well, I was going to do it again and do the controls in the second experiment. And you look at it and it's, it's this beautiful result. And you know, in the back of your mind, it's probably not going to look that beautiful the second time that they do the experiment. <laughs> and yes. You, you bite your tongue and you say, yeah, okay, go back and do the experiment again. <laughs> and you hope for the best, but uh, definitely beginner's luck tends to give the nicest result the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess on the flip side of the luck, for the 90%, for the 90% uh, not so nice part of it, yeah. you mentioned a little bit, just, you know, getting your way through it with perseverance. Is there any other ways you can think of that really helps you get through sort of the dark times, you can call it? Yeah, so I, I guess the other 90% doesn't have to be dark times because you, you learn something from every experiment that you do. But what's important is that you do all the proper controls in those experiments and if you've done all of the proper controls, you go back and you might not have proved your hypothesis, but you're able to learn something from that experiment. And 
um, adjust, come back and do the experiment again in a slightly different manner. Uh, and it might take you two or three tries of, but, but if you have all of the proper controls, eventually you're going to get it, is, is my feeling. Yeah. Uh, where, where some people go wrong is that they don't have necessarily all of the controls. And when they go to do the experiment the second time, they say, okay, it didn't work here using this protocol. So I'm going to go on the internet and find the protocol from somebody else, which has got four different things different in it compared to the original protocol. And then that one doesn't work either. And it actually looks worse than the first time you did the experiment. Um, really what you need to do is go back. You, you need to think about these experiments beforehand, What look at various different protocols uh, to see which one you think is going to work best. And maybe you choose the wrong one and it doesn't work. But when you go to redo the experiment, you don't change four different things in the experiment. You change one thing in the experiment. And did it help or did it not help? If not, if it didn't help, then we'll switch back to the original conditions for that one variable and then change a second variable. And, uh, Science is something that if you move through it systematically, uh, eventually you're going to find your way. Uh, th there are some questions out there that we just don't have the technologies to be able to answer the, um, the, the question at the moment. And if, if I look now at all of the single cell technology that we have available to us, if I had that available to me when I was doing my postdoc, then we, we could have answered many questions that we just had to sort of push off to the wayside um, as we were going forward because it, we, we were doing gene expression on a single gene. Uh, very often we were doing them on artificial genes because we needed to get high levels of expression higher than you would see on a, a normal gene. And now we're able to detect um, uh, one or two copies of an RNA in, in a cell and look at 20,000 different genes at the same time. So um, technology keeps advancing. And as, as we get these new technologies, I, th I think that we need to look back at some of the questions we weren't able to answer a couple of years ago and try and apply the technologies to some of those. Talking about advancements in the field, what do you think was the most important advancement in the field of molecular biology? Yeah. So when I was a postdoc, it, um, David Alice's group uh, were first identifying that some of the co-activators were uh, acetyltransferases. And um, when we started carrying out the, um, we, we started doing CHIP at that time. And the technique of CHIP had been around for a while, but we were able to show that um, we were seeing acetylation at, at genes. And this was changing as the transcription status was being modified. But uh, really when the high throughput sequencing came along, that, that's what allowed transformative changes to happen in the field of epigenetics, where we were able to start to correlate where the histone marks were with respect to genes which were uh, active, genes which were poised, um, genes which uh, were repressed and, and um, set up as heterochromatin. Uh, definitely being able to uh, use the high throughput sequencing uh, I, I guess first we moved to the, the uh, chip technology, the microarrays, uh, and that was, that was a big jump. And the, the, the jump from chip to um, high throughput sequencing doesn't seem like it would be that large. It, 
but in fact, it gave us the information at a more precise level uh, that really allowed us to understand how these histone marks associate with different regions of the genome. And, and uh, for me, I think that that was the biggest technological advance in my time of epigenetics. Uh, of course, we're, we're applying these to single cells now and, uh, and we're learning a lot more, but I, I think there, there was a transformative change at, at that point. If you have to choose now, what is your favorite technique? What is my favorite technique? My favorite technique is one that no one in my laboratory wants to do anymore. It's uh, in vitro transcription. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I set up uh, as a postdoc uh, when I was in Pierre Chambon's lab. We, uh, we would take plasmids and um, we would uh, generate chromat uh, nucleosomal arrays on them using Drosophila extracts. And so you had to uh, sleep in the lab for a few days in order to collect these embryo extracts, either at every three hours or every six hours uh, from big population cages of Drosophila. Uh, and yeah, you, you would have to centrifuge them down, have them be very fresh. And from those nucleosomal arrays, you could generate a plasmid that uh, was transcriptionally silent. And then we would put in different uh, purified proteins and be able to activate transcription. And uh, it was really a tool that allowed you to um, dissect what was the role of the different uh, transcription factors and co-activators. And we were able to uh, do temporal type studies and see, well, you have to have a histone acetyltransferase bind to the promoter before a chromatin remodeling complex in order to establish efficiently the um, nucleosome positions that are going to allow the activation of transcription. Uh, yeah, so it, it was a lot of work, but a lot of fun uh, to do. A lot more fun when it worked. <laughs> it, 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 it took a few years to get in place, but when it finally worked, I, I would say that was uh, uh, one of the highlights of my career getting that, getting that uh, auto radiograph in front of me where there no retinoic acid, there was no transcription and retinoic acid, you had nice transcription occurring. Yeah. I guess these days for us, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine to do, to do something like that. I, I personally have never done it myself. <laughs> yes, the, the, well, the, the technologies have advanced a long way since uh, I, I was a postdoc. We had to uh, pour, pour these big sequencing gels and hope that they don't leak. And, um, yeah. If they did leak, you had to take it all apart and clean them all up again and start all over again. It was, uh, yeah, a little bit more convenient now. So a little bit adjacent to this question, but would you say that you have a favorite scientist? I have many favorite scientists, uh, but de definitely my favorite scientist would be Pierre Chambon, uh, who was uh, my postdoc mentor. He's made so many important discoveries over the years. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, a lot of the trainees these days will know who he is because he's um, pretty much retired now. But in the days he he was at the forefront, um, definitely in the area of gene expression, but also in, in epigenetics. And things that he's done are um, purify the three different RNA polymerases to, to show that there were three different forms there. He was... Um, he discovered the estrogen receptor. Uh, so uh, the, so he, he and Ron Evans were the first to discover the nuclear receptors and, and that these would be the manner in which uh, steroid hormones would activate transcription. 
Uh, he did most of the work defining what enhancers and promoters were, uh, d defining these using viral systems to do it. Uh, and towards the, the later part of his career, he got very much into mouse work and trying to um, study the role of the transcription factors in, in different tissues using mouse knockouts. But, uh, yeah, over his career, he's done so many amazing things that I was lucky to have the opportunity to work with him. Yeah, it sounds like he's done a lot. I can definitely remember a lot of those things you just mentioned, not necessarily attached to his name, but within my classes. He definitely, yeah. his work has been mentioned quite a bit. So after you went from France to um, Seattle, was there, what specifically brought you to the muscle system? in your work? Yeah, so, so when I was finishing up in um, Pierre Chambon's group, we, we had a interesting new model for how gene activation would work and that the uh, transcription factors would recruit in co-activators in a temporal manner and activate transcription. But um, what we couldn't explain was why in one cell retinoic acid would turn on gene A, but in a different cell it would turn on gene B. And so I thought that it was very important for us to try and start looking at gene expression in terms of development. And at the time that I was finishing up uh, my postdoc in Pierre Chambon's lab, uh, Steve Tapscott in Seattle um, was doing the first work on um, microarrays, it was at the time, looking at how the transcription factor MyOD in muscle cells could um, be expressed and it could turn on one set of genes early, another set of genes at an intermediate time and a third set of genes at a later time point. And this became a problem that uh, I felt that I needed to solve. And uh, so I moved to Seattle and uh, set up an in vitro transcription system there where uh, we purified the MyOD transcription factor and co-activators, and um, we felt that this would need to uh, be done on actual genes as opposed to artificial genes, the way we had been doing in Strasbourg. And so we started trying to piece together um, how the same transcription factor could turn on different genes uh, in a temporally ordered fashion. And, and that's what pulled me into the muscle field. Um, and as, as the, I was going with those experiments, uh, of course, the epigenetic field continued growing and it was quite clear that the co-activators that these transcription factors were recruiting in were epigenetic regulators, whether they be the histone acetyltransferases or the methyl um, transferases, demethylases. Uh, and so, it just, I, I started doing those experiments in the muscle system and, and it made sense when I started my laboratory that that's what I would continue on with. For, for the people who are not as familiar with um, muscle cells and when you talk about the muscle system, um, could you elaborate on what that system is and, and why it allows you to look in a temporal manner at, at these prescriptional processes? Okay, yeah, that's a great point. I'm talking about muscle systems. And here in Ottawa, we've got uh, a great muscle program. Uh, but I have to remember that not everyone's interested in muscle regeneration. <laughs> or not, not everyone knows that they're interested in muscle regeneration. <laughs> uh, yeah, so muscle is uh, a fascinating tissue because it is able to regenerate itself. And yeah, very often, we think about uh, regenerative tissues and people think of the liver, um, that uh, you, you can transplant liver or people donate blood and their blood stem cells are going to regenerate their, uh, their blood over the next few weeks. And not so many people think about uh, muscle as being a regenerative tissue, but muscle has a stem cell that's resident within that tissue that um, you, could, you could have a catastrophic injury within a muscle 
uh, that would destroy all the muscle fibers, yet the stem cells that are present within that tissue would be able to regrow the entire muscle in a few weeks, uh, within a month. So uh, it's really an extraordinary system that way. And so these muscle stem cells are called satellite cells and normally they're dormant within the muscle. And what happens when you have the muscle injury is that they're going to be awoken, um, move out of quiescence and uh, start to replicate because each muscle fiber is made up of uh, the fusion of thousands of cells together. And it might have one stem cell for every 10 to 50 cells that are needed to make a muscle fiber. So you need to have a large expansion of those stem cells in order to remake a muscle fiber. Um, so th there's a transition from the resting state into a proliferative state or um, a multiplication of the cell number state. And then you have to convert those cells from the um, stem cell state into a functional muscle cell and these cells fuse together. And so the muscle system provides an excellent opportunity to understand how you go from the genes being turned on in this one cell that uh, is dormant, a different set of genes being turned on in the proliferating cells, and then a third set of genes being turned on that allow those muscles to be functional and, and contract that allow you to move. Um, and what's really, what really got me interested in the epigenetics of muscle is uh, a study that came out of, um, out of a group in Paris. And they were actually looking at cadavers of people who had lived full lives and died of natural causes when they were, uh, the average age was over a hundred years old of these cadavers that they went in and uh, isolated the muscle from. And they were able to recover the satellite cells, the muscle stem cells from those tissues and put them in culture and those cells were still alive. So without any oxygen going to those cells for uh, many, many days, those cells were still alive. The, the rest of the body was not living anymore. Oh, wow. you're, you're able to put those in culture. And uh, what that really got me thinking about was the fact that these stem cells, they're, they're made um, in, in the fetus. They're, they're there, they're used in order to make your muscle as you're developing as a baby. They're, they're also there when you're a teenager and you go through a growth spurt all your muscles need to get longer at the same time as your bones. So, so they're very efficient at working at that time. However, when we get to be older, uh, uh, a senior citizen, the, those stem cells are still present, but they don't respond to the, um, they're not responding to the signals that are coming from the body saying we need to regenerate the muscle and therefore you get muscle wasting and people become frail. But those stem cells are still there and the DNA that is in those stem cells is the same DNA that was in the embryonic cell. What has changed over time is our environment, the foods that we eat, the exercise that we do has changed the epigenetic signatures or landscape within those cells and determined that instead of packing the cell the way it would for it to be a hyperactive cell that's able to regenerate the entire muscle in within a month. Now all of a sudden it's a cell that has a hard time waking up and getting out of bed in the morning. And so how 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 has the cell changed over this period of time? And is there a way that we could make those stem cells think that they were young again? Can we find the mechanisms that lead to this new packing mechanism and switch it to the packing mechanism that's in a supercharged cell. And that's really what drives my interest in, in uh, this process. I, I do think you're right when it, 
at the start, you said that uh, people might not know that they're interested in the muscle system. Uh, I think you just triggered my interest in it. It, it, especially the story about how the stem cells were still al like alive in, yeah. in cadaver. That, that, that is fascinating. Yes, it's amazing that um, w without any blood coming to them, without any oxygen coming to them, they're uh, just lying there dormant and still protected and, and able to be put back in culture. I, I found that paper fascinating. It's definitely something that pertains to all of us too. We all eventually get old, unfortunately. So it's nice if we can delay that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think all of us want to enjoy our, our senior years. Once we um, get some time to go traveling, we want to be able to hike through the mountains and uh, walk along the beach, and do all of the things we did when we were young. So that, that, that would be an ideal scenario. Yes. Definitely would be. So I think this brings us to a little bit of what you've been doing in the lab. So what kind of questions are you asking in the lab about this muscle system? Yeah, so we're trying to understand how the cells decide whether they're going to stay in the dormant stage or whether they're going to move into the proliferative stage or differentiate it. And this is an important question uh, because of the fact that, of course, as we get older, the stem cells don't work as well. And, and definitely work in mice has suggested that um, one of the reasons that people have smaller muscles as they get older uh, and therefore have frailty is that the muscle cells that are expanding their numbers are not able to do so as efficiently. And so they'll decide that they have enough cells and they will turn into functional muscle cells um, prematurely. And, and so what we're trying to understand in the laboratory is what are the decision makers within the cell that say, I want to continue um, expanding our numbers, or I want to differentiate. Uh, and, I, and I keep talking about all of these muscle cells moving in a forward direction from sleeping to proliferating to becoming a functional muscle cell. But at the same time, you have to have your, um, your expanding cell population also moving back into the resting state because otherwise you would have one muscle injury and all of your stem cells would be gone. So you, you have to repopulate uh, this uh, stem cell compartment. And so, so what are the decisions that ensure that you're going to expand that stem cell population so that you have a nice, robust, healthy muscle, but at the same time, you have to make enough cells for them to move backwards and repopulate the niche so that this process can go on until we're 80, 90 years old. You, you, you don't want to deplete that population. And yeah, so, so definitely we're um, trying to resolve the question in the laboratory of why these cells are going to make their decision to stay quiescent or resting, proliferate or differentiate. And can we manipulate it? Because we know that as you get older, these cells are not going to expand as long. Is there some way that we could trick them into thinking that they do need to expand for a longer period of time? And whether that be exercise or uh, change in your diet, th these sorts of things, they're uh, answers that we would like to get at uh, and, and quickly because I'm getting old fast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you want to uh, tell us about what, what is one of your favorite, um, I guess, findings or results that you've had during your career? Yes. So I, I was very lucky uh, with the first postdoc who came to my laboratory, uh, Shravanti. Uh, she was very much interested in epigenetics. She had already been working on epigenetics in India before coming to my group. And uh, she... Uh, was working on a project trying to understand how the epigenetic machinery was being recruited to uh, the muscle genes in order to turn on the gene expression program. 
And in a, a lot of what we knew about epigenetic enzymes being recruited to genes was from Drosophila at that time. And there either the epigenetic enzymes had regions in the DNA that they recognized and bound to, to activate genes, or um, RNA was being used to recruit the, um, the factors to different spots in the genome. And we had this idea because of the fact that in muscle systems, MyOD can take any different cell type and convert it into a muscle cell, which means that you can take a skin cell and express MyOD in it. MyOD is going to make that cell forget all of its epigenetics that says that it's a skin cell and it's going to take on a muscle epigenetic landscape and form a cell that can contract. And so at the time we were thinking, well, MyOD must be able to grab a hold of all of those epigenetic factors and pull them onto another gene and basically reset things. And so it was a little bit outside of the box at the time, but we, we went forward with it. And in fact, we, we were the first group in the world to show that it was actually transcription factors that recruit the H2L methyltransferase complex onto a gene. Now, my, my hypothesis that it would be MyOD that would do that recruiting was not correct, but we were correct in thinking that it was a transcription factor and we were able to solve which transcription factor it was. And so it, in fact, what we found was that MyOD will go to all of the muscle genes and, and set them up for transcription. But right next to MyOD, it, it's setting up uh, an environment that allows another transcription factor called MEF2 to come and bind beside it. And the MEF2 protein is what is recruiting in the epigenetic enzymes. And, and what's interesting about that is that MEF2 is expressed in all different cell types. It's not a muscle specific factor. So in fact, you're having a muscle specific factor being expressed in your skin cell. It, it goes and it changes um, where the open chromatin is and allows that MEF2 protein to come and bind at a new set of genes and bring in the epigenetic machinery. And, and what that allows is that all different cells can use the same mechanism. So, so it, it's not your cell specific transcription factor, which is driving the gene activation. It's the cell specific factor allowing the binding of a ubiquitous factor at that promoter and then activation of gene expression. Uh, so, um, because that was our first major discovery in the laboratory and we published that in Nature Structural and Molecular Biology, um, it's uh, one that's dear to my heart. We, we, we've had other ones and I, I don't mean to shortchange any of the other great discoveries anyone's made in my laboratory. I've had lots of great people over the years who've made um, really exciting discoveries, but uh, being the first, that, that one really, uh, jumps out at me if you ask that question. Yeah, the first publication is always a little bit special there. Yes. Given, you know, um, um, all the expertise you have, I was wondering if you could provide us with a piece of advice, you know, thinking about first year PhDU, but then also first year postdoc U and first year PIU. What are important things for at these different uh, stages of our careers, um, advice that we can use? Yeah. Okay, so first your PhDU, I would say um, be methodical about how you go about doing your experiments and do all of the proper controls. When you run into problems, don't think that you're the only person who doesn't, who's not able to do the experiment. There's lots of people who don't have success on their first tries and keep at it. If you do all the proper controls, you're going to be able to figure out what's going wrong and be able to make it work. 
and it, try not to get discouraged. I, I think that that's um, where a, a lot, we lose a lot of scientists is they get discouraged very early on and it's not because they're less good than another scientist, but um, just they didn't get the beginner's luck that others got. So don't, don't be discouraged, keep at it. And, and eventually you're gonna, if you do the experiments properly, think about them, you're eventually gonna make it work. Uh, for, for a postdoc, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because there's d different kinds of postdocs. I, I think if you're very confident in your abilities, you should choose um, to go to a, a big laboratory that has lots of money that is going to allow you to arrive there and basically do whatever experiment you can think of. And I think that's what I was able to do when I went to Pierre Chambon's laboratory. The um, cost of the experiments was not any uh, impediment to, to being able to perform them. And so uh, anything you could think up, you could do. And, and so I, I recommend uh, people who have had success and, and are confident in their abilities, that, that's uh, what I would try and do is, is choose a laboratory that will let you um, be creative and use your imagination and solve exciting problems. Uh, for, for somebody just starting out in their laboratory, um, I would say make sure you get in there and, and do a lot of experiments yourself. You're, you're starting out and you're going to have some trainees in your laboratory that uh, don't have a lot of background in the area of research that you're working in. And so you should um, get in there and, and show them how to do the experiments. You're the one who knows best how to do them. and. Um, it's going to be important that you pass that knowledge on to the trainees and eventually there's going to come a time where those trainees are going to pass the information on to uh, new trainees coming into the laboratory and the more time you spend in there with that first set of trainees ensuring they've got all the basics in place uh, the better it's going to be when they go to transfer the information on down the line so um, of course, we all have to write our grants and um, and get the funding for our research. But at the same time, it's very, very important that you get off on the right foot and, and get the trainees in there um, very familiar with the technologies that you want to develop in the group. Great. Thank you for that advice. Thank you for your time here, Jeff. It's been a great time talking to you. Lots of great advice and good stories there. Okay. Well, thank you, Ed. Thanks, Sunny. It's been great talking with you today. Have a very nice day. Bye-bye, yeah. everyone. Thank you for listening to This Is Epigenetics. If you like this episode, don't forget to go on our website for more informative content about epigenetics. And stay tuned for next episode where we'll interview, in French, Dr. Serge Maigrat.